Well, good morning and welcome. Welcome to worship at Middleburg Baptist Church Online, our first service of the day. We thank you guys for coming from wherever you are, on your couch, in your pajamas. You could be dressed to the nines. We're always happy that you're here. Hey, this morning I wanted to give you fair warning that we will be taking communion later on in the service. So uh, go uh, stop the video, go down to your refrigerator, get some juice and, and some bread, and, and we'll take communion together after the sermon and after the message. Again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are in the book of Mark. We are in chapter 8, verses 27 through 30. Let's prepare our hearts with the scripture. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Enjoy the service, everyone. King would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, all oh, is free indeed. I'm a child.
you say Jesus was? I have no idea. Who was Jesus? Gosh, I have to start with, I'm not sure. Who was Jesus to you? Some guy. Actually, I don't believe in Jesus. Not really sure exactly who Jesus was. I think Jesus was, uh, was a was kind of a cool guy back in his day. Who was Jesus to you? <laughs> I think I'm done. I don't like to talk about it. I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not religious. Who do you think Jesus was, or is? Uh, Jesus was a historical figure. I believe that Jesus Christ was a man who had an extraordinary ability to link in with the Creator. I think he was uh, definitely someone that people you know, a good role model. I, I do think he had a lot of great ideas. More or less, he was just a prophet, which is just a messenger of God. Sort of a revolutionary in his day. Jesus was an amazing man. I don't believe he's God's son. I just believe he's a person. As to his, like, godlike quality, I'm not totally sold on that. You think he was a prophet? And I would, see, I'd have to be Christian to really believe that. Jesus was the Messiah for some people and for some people he wasn't. I'm not necessarily sure if Jesus was the Messiah or a prophet, but in either case he was somebody that spoke the word of God. He was equal portions of of human and uh, and that energy that is God. People said he was sent by God. Well no one God doesn't send him down. You don't go on up. <laughs> I mean you he linked in. I mean, I do believe in Jesus in the sense of like, yeah, I believe in Jesus. That I'm, I'm not saying that he, he didn't exist or anything of the sort, but the fact that, um, I mean, I necessarily don't go and uh, pray to Jesus. Who was Jesus? Uh, Jesus is some God. Jesus was the Son of God. I believe Jesus is the Son of God who came to save us all from our sins. Jesus was a Savior. Who died for our sins and cleaned us, made us pure enough to enter God's glory. The, um, only way you can get to heaven. Who do you think Jesus is? Um, who do I think he is? I, I don't think it's who he was. I think he still is Jesus, so he's not gone or anything, you know. I guess in body technically he is, but he's still here. The Jesus story sort of borders on history and myth for me. Um, but I don't believe that it could have permeated our culture so fully and for so long if there was nothing to that. Good morning and welcome to Middleburg Baptist Church. We're so thrilled that you are joining us online for our very first service of the day. I can't believe it is the last Sunday in September and it means so much that you're joining us live here this morning. I, I want to ask a question as we've been kind of going through the series here in Mark and we're going to jump into Mark chapter 8, but what does it mean to be like Jesus. What does it mean to look like Jesus? You know, what's interesting is yesterday we had a memorial service, a celebration of life for one of the saints in our church, Mary Lee Phelps. Mary Lee had grown up in this community. She was baptized in this church. She taught Sunday school for 25 years. She was the very first female deacon that this church ever had. And she was just an incredible woman of God. Not my words, uh, but her children just rose up yesterday and just shared how much of a woman of God Mary Lee really was. And here's what's interesting is that Mary Lee wasn't uh, devoid of any storm. She did walk 
with Jesus through the storms. You know, we've experienced two storms in the book of Mark so far, and last week one of the things that I found was interesting and I kind of tried to draw out of the, of, of the passage was Jesus made his disciples get in the boat. And then he went off to pray. And so the disciples are all by themselves and then they're crossing across the lake and then a a large windstorm, middle of the night, they're out there in the very middle of the lake and they're just straining. Well, what's interesting about that is Mary Lee also was straining. Mary Lee experienced storms in her life. When her youngest daughter, Lee, was only seven years old, her husband died of an aneurysm. And uh, she also had a a 14-year-old son, a 22-year-old daughter. And and so this family of three, Mary Lee now found herself as a widow. And what was interesting is that many people uh, approached me and said, you know, Mary Lee never like felt sorry for herself. In fact, what she said, because she had this incredible peace of walking with Jesus as her Savior, she said, don't worry about me. God will take care of us. I, in some ways, I find her faith as she lived her life larger than even the disciples that we will read about today and that we learned about last week and the week before. Mary Lee knew her Savior, and she loved him with all of her heart. Well, this morning we're going to pick up in Mark chapter 8, and we are going to learn what it means to be like Jesus and less like the world. And what does it mean to be like Jesus? Well, the first thing, and you can follow along in your outline, we have it up on Facebook, or you can uh, see there on YouTube that we have the notes attached there as well. But what does it mean to be like Jesus? Well, the first thing is it means that we will go and serve others. Go and serve others. Mark chapter 8 verse 1 says, During those days another large crowd gathered. During those days. I have to kind of go back to last week that we found that Jesus was in the Decapolis area. This was a a Gentile region. There weren't very many Jews at all in this area. This was the same area that we learned uh, about a month ago where the man was there in the tombs and he was cutting himself. He was demonized by legion. This is that same area. So during those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples disciples to him and he said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with us for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. Now Jesus wasn't exaggerating here. They would have been absolutely exhausted. And you'll remember that we talked about Jesus fed 5,000 men Uh, there up near the Bethsaida area, and what a miracle that was. And so now we're going to talk about the feeding of 4,000. It's not the same event. It's two separate events. But one of the things that I love about here is we see that Jesus had compassion. It's, uh, It's common for us as Christians that sometimes we can get a little bit of a hardened heart in helping others because we feel like, well, it's, we just have no compassion. And, and it's important to remember here that Jesus had compassion on them, that he saw the need and he wanted to fill it. He was encouraging us to be like him and to go serve others. Verse 4, his disciples answered, Jesus, where we are in this remote place. How can anyone get enough bread to feed them? And then Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? Seven, they replied. Now, if you remember the story of the feeding of 5,000, a very similar kind of conversation occurred there. And so I'm thinking, and I don't know about you, but if this is you know, if I'm one of the disciples, I'm like, I've heard this before. I kind of know where this is probably going to go. But as we're going to see, the disciples weren't catching on. And so they had seven loaves and some fish. Verse six, 
He told the crowd to sit on the ground, and when he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. How many of you, you know, pray before you have a meal together? You know, we do in our house. Uh, sometimes we're out in a restaurant and we'll all be kind of looking at each other and reach out there and hold hands with one another. And I just do a, a brief thankful prayer that God has continued to provide for us Morgans that we can go out and, and eat together. And probably many of you do as well. But this is where we get that, where Jesus would stop and he would give thanks to his Father in heaven. Verse 7, they had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. They were satisfied. (laughs) Afterward, his disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. And here we go. About 4,000 were present. After he sent them away, he got into a boat, went with his disciples, and went to the region of Dalmathua. Now, One of the things that I want to point out is this word basketfuls. You know, you think of a big hamper. You don't have a, a hamper that's really small. You have like a, a large, you know, hamper. That's what the Greek word is kind of referencing here. It wasn't small baskets. In fact, feeding of the 5,000, they actually had smaller baskets. These were large basketfuls of broken fish and bread that were left over. Also, the difference in the feeding of the 5,000, they referenced men. And so we could actually add women to the feeding of the 5,000 and children. Some theologians think there could have been as many as 15,000 there on that miracle. On this miracle, it's just the whole crowd. So women, children, everybody, they just gave a a number of 4,000 that were fed there in the Decapolis area. And then they get into the boat and then they head on over to Dalmathua. Now, this is an Old Testament reference, and what we know today is the region is Magdala. And here's a a map of where Magdala is, and some of you might already remember, there was a, a woman by the name of Mary, Mary Magdalene, and they would reference her for the town that she was with. So she was from Magdala. On my trip to Israel, we actually got to go through there and see where the temple was and, and saw some of the uh, beautiful textile that they were uh, excavating and archaeologically working on. It was just a beautiful site there, but it's right there uh, just to the west side of the Sea of Galilee. Here's my question for you this morning is, do you have compassion on others? Do you have Jesus's compassion on others? It is so important that as you walk and do life and live life with others, your family, your friends, those that you work with, that you also have compassion on them when they have a need. Well, Jesus still calls us today to go and serve. The second thing, in order to be like Jesus, we go serve others. And the second is to keep your heart from hardening. I love this phrase because Jesus has said this quite a few times. If, if you've ever worked with uh, drywall, we had a work day here at the church just last weekend, and we were filling some holes and then repainting. And what's so great about the drywall mud is it's, it, it's really, well, it feels like mud, and then it dries on there, and it's so great because you can paint over it and you can sand it. And I, I kept thinking, you know, about our hearts, that, that Jesus wants our hearts nice and soft and moldable, He doesn't want a hardened heart. So let's take a look at what we see here in verse 11, chapter 8. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. Look at this. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. Now, so far up to this point, there's only really been one sign from heaven. Do you remember where, where that was? That was when John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus and he received a sign from heaven. And do you remember he, he heard a voice and saw the, the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus like a dove? And he heard a voice from heaven, this is my son who I'm well pleased. That was a sign from heaven. 
Mark uses a different Greek word for miracle. So they weren't asking to see a miracle. They've actually, the Pharisees and, and, and other legalists there, they've seen a few miracles from Jesus. That wasn't the issue. The issue now is we want to see a sign from heaven to affirm that you are the Son of God. And look at Jesus' response in verse 12. He sighed deeply. That word is where we kind of get exasperated. Have you ever been exasperated with your kids? You're just like, oh, I can't believe it. He sighed deeply. He was exasperated. And he said, why does this generation ask for a sign? I tell you the truth. Truly, no one, no one is going to, uh, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them. He got into the boat and he crossed to the other side. They were testing him. Have you ever tested God? Have you ever challenged God? Have you ever shaken your fist at God? We do not want to walk in our faith with Jesus and test God. And that's exactly what they were doing. Because what's interesting is they wanted something specific, and yet Jesus' miracles were speaking for themselves that he is indeed the Son of God. Verse 14, the disciples had forgotten to bring some bread. A lot of us feel this way, right? You go to the store or whatever and you forget. Uh, Except for one loaf that they had with them in the boat. Okay, they're getting hungry. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And so the disciples began to discuss this with one another, and, it's, and they said, is it because we don't have any bread? <laughs> Again, uh, my dad, uh, when he was alive, he would always uh, take sourdough bread. I'm from California, and if you've ever enjoyed sourdough bread from like San Francisco, but he would actually bake it and you would always take just a pinch of the of the yeast and then you would share it some of you have done this before and it's just incredible um, flavors that just the sourdough kind of brings out but it's a uh, friendship bread you know and you you share that with with one another and then you add the rest of the ingredients and then you make your make your bread what does yeast and leaven do it it helps the bread to rise most of you probably already know that And what Jesus is referring to here is not the literal bread. He was actually talking about the Pharisees' hypocrisy and their legalism because they were testing him back in verse 11. Verse 17, they're sitting there in the boat, aware of their discussion. Jesus asked him, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? There's our, there's our phrase again. Do you have eyes but fail to see, and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketful of pieces did you pick up? They replied, 12. In verse 20, he says, And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000 <laughs> just earlier today, how many basketfuls and pieces did you pick up? And they said, seven. He said to them, Do you still not understand? Here's the point. The point is that God is faithful. We don't need to go and ask God. We don't need to test Him. All we need to do is be faithful and actually have eyes to see and ears to hear where He is already at work all around us. It's that individual who experiences a miracle and then just shortly after, kind of asked God for another sign. And he's like, you've already received a miracle. Don't question or misunderstand that I love you, that I'm faithful, and that I'm here with you. Don't forget. Don't forget God's work in your life up until now. We don't need to test him because he loves us and he has been and will continue to be faithful in whatever storm you are going through. So we want to be like Jesus and serve others, keep our hearts from hardening. And then number three, we want to bring our friends to Jesus. And we've seen this almost every week. Verse 22, they came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. So he took the blind man 
by the hand. He led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? Who in your life, in your family and your friends, are you doing everything you can in prayer or exposing them to the Word of God to bring them to Jesus? And so he asked the man, what, do you see anything? Look at, look, watch, watch what happens here in verse 24. The man looked up. He said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, and then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Why the two miracles? Why the, you know, why the, the two-sided or the two-part or the two-element of the miracle for this man to receive his sight? Well, did some research on it, and theologians believe that there's, there's something really kind of cool going on here. That First of all, that Jesus laid his hands on the man for the very first time, and he could see color. He could see light. Uh, it wasn't clear, but, but, here, but don't miss this. So that in and of itself was a miracle. But then what Jesus was doing is drawing out the man's faith to accomplish the second side of the miracle, and that was to be able to see 2020. This morning, God's been working in your life. And maybe you're seeing, you know, 1515, or, you know, it's not 2020. And so sometimes God does a little bit and he's waiting for you and your seed of faith to grow so that he can complete and finish it so that you can see 2020. I think Jesus' miracles all connect to one another somehow. And so we want to be like Jesus and serve others and keep our hearts from hardening. We want to bring our friends and family members to Jesus. And then number four, we need to ask life's most important question. Verse 27, Jesus and disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And you can see here on the map where Philippi is. It's about 25 you know, miles north of the Sea of Galilee. So they're not there at the, at the lake right now. They, they actually went, went up north. On the way, he asked them, hey guys, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. How would you answer that question? How would you answer? Because I believe that Jesus is asking you, who do you say I am? I believe Jesus asks all of us each and every day because we need to remind ourselves what our life is about. Look at verse 29. What about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And here's our key question. And this is a personal question that all of us have to answer. I believe right now, this morning, who is Jesus Christ to you? I'm not asking you who Jesus Christ is to your parents. I'm not asking you who they are to your children. I'm not asking you who Jesus is to your best friends. I'm not asking you what Pastor Dan says about who Jesus is. At this point in our study, the question is directly straight to you. Who do you say I am? C.S. Lewis, his favorite book that I wrote is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. He said, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus Christ said wouldn't be a great moral teacher. He'd either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg or else he'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else he is a madman or something worse. And this is the question that you and I have to answer today, this morning. Who is Jesus Christ to you? 
Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man was going to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again, which all, by the way, historically occurred. He's talking about his crucifixion. He's letting his disciples know this inner circle, hey, this is coming. This is We're about a year away from it at this particular point. Verse 32, he spoke plainly about this, and look what Peter does. He took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You know, what's interesting about this, and by the way, I mean, getting a rebuke from Jesus and saying, get behind me, Satan, but haven't we all sort of done that? Haven't there been a storm that's occurred in your life or some kind of event that's happened historically, and you kind of sit back and you say, you know, we sort of shake our fingers at Jesus and say, you're wrong. You are incorrect. And yet, Jesus, this whole time, is saying, well, you've got man's concerns, not the concerns of God. And this is a very humble moment for you and I as we look at this particular passage to realize that God is in control, God has a plan, and our job is to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to implement that plan wherever that may lead us. You know, I I think about the concerns of God. Jesus has gone around and he's been healing people. He's been performing miracles. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they were followers of Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are times that that I believe Jesus healed individuals that they may not have necessarily continued to follow Jesus. And so some of us could quickly say, well, you know, if I was Jesus at this particular time, I would have just gone to all the hospitals. All I would have done was just walked around and healed everybody. But again, that's the concerns of humanity of you and I, because we want God to make our lives better. Jesus came, my friends, to honor and obey his father. And his father sent, and the purpose of Jesus was to save and to seek after the lost. You see, Jesus came as a Messiah, not to go take you know, political, not to go take Rome, but Jesus came to set up a earthly kingdom and he was establishing himself as the Messiah, the one that could remove your sin and my sin as far as the east is from the west and allow us to experience the presence of God. See, Jesus had a God-centered purpose in his life, not a man-centered and, and I, again, I love Peter. Peter just says a lot of things that you and I probably would be thinking. But again, Jesus rebuked Peter and he goes, he goes but, you know, I, I love you, but, but get behind me, Satan. I, I mean, what you just said, Peter, is not a part of the Father's plan for my life. Wow, what a moment that must have been and a teachable moment for all the disciples. So we want to be like Jesus and ask life's most important questions. And then finally, we want to prioritize God's will above ourselves. Verse 34, then then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and he says, this is a tough one, you ready? Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves Take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will actually save it. This is tough. There are three things that Jesus identified. You've got to take up your cross, you've got to follow him, and you've got to deny yourself. Here's a question. Was Jesus just talking to the disciples back then? I mean, that's not for us today, right? Well, it is for us today. It is for us today. So I want to kind of break apart these three elements to this incredible challenge and commitment that Jesus was calling his disciples to make. The first one was deny yourself 
or live for yourself. So you either deny yourself or live for yourself. You, you die to your ambition and you replace it with living for God's ambition. Now, some of us grew up in a tradition, church tradition, where we would honor Lent. Y'all know what Lent is, right? It's where you give up something for a certain period of time. Uh, Maybe it's uh, tobacco or alcohol or sugar or watching the news or whatever. And hopefully we would lay aside those passions so that we would... uh, reignite a passion for for God. And so we do that just for a a season. We call it Lent. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. You know, Jesus here is saying that I want your life. I want your whole being. I want you 100% to follow after me. You've got to deny yourself. So your ambition needs to be set aside, and your focus and purpose need to be on me and following after my Father's will. That's the first one. The second one was take up the cross. Now, I don't have a cross around my neck at this particular moment. We hang a cross up here in the church. We have crosses hung up on our walls in our home, and yes, they are decorative, but whenever I see the cross, and whenever you see the cross, what do you think of? Because I've seen, you know, those in the entertainment industry, whether they're singers or actors and different ones, um, athletes, and sometimes they'll have a cross. And that doesn't mean that they're following Jesus or have anything to do with Jesus. It Maybe it's just sort of a good luck charm to them. In this particular time, if you had a cross, it was an emblem of death. It was it was the execution chair. It was injection, a lethal injection for you know, a prisoner on death row. And just kind of think about that. And so when, when he says take up the, our cross, when you see the cross there hanging in your home, it's important to remember that this is a symbol of me dying to myself and saying yes to God. I'm going to say yes to God's way and no to the world's way. I'm going to say yes to whatever Jesus wants me to do. I'm going to deny myself and say yes to God's way. I am going to follow you even to the point of death. And then he says, follow me or follow the world or the current culture or popular opinion. Again, C.S. Lewis has some incredible quotes, and one of the things he says is, either Jesus is the Son of God, or he's a madman or worse, but his being just a great teacher, he's not left that option up to us. Therefore, we, we honor Jesus and we follow him, we deny ourselves, we take up our cross f- because he is the Messiah and he is our Savior. I have a biblical example because I do know there have been times in my life and and other people that I've talked to, and there's times when we will come across a command that's found in the scriptures, and we're like, well, yeah, you know, I I, I just, I'm just not going to follow that one. I don't know if you've ever been like that, but uh, you know, Jesus, you can have everything else, but not that one. That's my favorite sin. (laughs) No, okay. But but here's uh, an example in Jesus' day, and it's found in John chapter 6, and let me just read part of it. At this, the Jews began to grumble about Jesus, because Jesus said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I came down from heaven? Well, they're, they're asking a decent question, but they're completely misunderstanding. They, they have the, the world's mindset. They certainly don't have God's mindset and ears to hear what Jesus is teaching and wanting his disciples to do. Let me just read you one of the saddest verses I have found in the Bible. It's John chapter 6, verse 66. It says this, From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed Jesus. I just think that is the saddest verse in the Bible. They were so close, so close. But 
Again, as we look back on the different soils that uh, Jesus talked about, the, the parable of the sower and the soils, and that different individuals, the, the seed of the Word of God is going to fall on different hearts. And depending on what kind of heart that is, uh, it is going to grow or not. And I just find that verse so sad. Verse 67, Jesus said, and this is again in John 6, you don't want to leave two, do you? And Jesus asked the twelve, and Simon Peter, here's Simon, Lord, whom shall we go? You have the very words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. I love that. I, I want to remind you of Proverbs in the Old Testament. And Proverbs 3 says, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. And I think that is a promise as much as it is a, a, a proclamation. But when we submit ourselves to God, when we follow, when we deny ourselves, when we take up our cross, we are submitting ourselves with all of our heart. And we're not going to lean on our own understanding. We're going to lean on the revelation from God's word as we read it here in the New and the Old Testament. Well, picking it back up and closing up Mark chapter 8, Jesus provides a, a stark, direct, maybe even confrontational warning. Look at this in verse 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Again, I kind of mentioned earlier that if you're struggling with the words of Jesus as whether they are right or true, um, the first step for you is to pause and answer the question, if, who is Jesus? And if Jesus is the Son of God, if He is the Savior, if He is the Messiah, that means He came to remove your sin as far as the East is from the West. That means that He loves you and He knows all about your sin and what He's asking you to do is agree with Him and confess that to Him. My encouragement for you this morning is that you will take that step and say, yes, Jesus, I believe that you are my Savior, you are my Messiah, and I want to follow you, and I will deny myself, I will take up the cross, and I will follow you all the days of my life. I started off the message this morning with talking about Miss Mary Lee Phelps and just the life and the legacy that she left as you know, a, a saint to us. And it's just incredible how she loved her God with all her heart, even in the midst of going through difficult times and storms. There's three things I want you to do this morning as we close is embrace the NBC vision. And that is to gather every Sunday Make sure that you take time each and every Sunday to either watch online or be here in person to gather, to grow. To grow is to join one of our small groups and make sure that you're, you're learning the Word of God. Number three is that you would go, that you would serve God as we saw here, and that you would give, that you would financially support the ministry of our church as we are serving the greater kingdom of God. That's the first thing. Embrace our NBC vision. The second thing is you've got to answer life's number one most important question. Personally to you, who is Jesus? Is he a legend? Is he a liar? Or is he a prophet? Or is he the actual savior and Lord. The third thing is that you would deny yourself, that you would place your personal ambition aside, and that you would embrace and hold on to the vision that Jesus has for your life. And we do that by keeping God's word number one, not the world, not the culture.
in the crushing, in the pressing, you are making who I in the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground so I yield to you and to your careful hand I trust you I don't need to understand make me a vessel make me offering, beg me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, and all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. You are breaking. So bring me an offering, bring me whatever you want me to be. Came here with nothing, with all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine. Power of me, Jesus, bring a new wine. Power of me, where there is new wine, there is new power, there is new freedom. The kingdom is here. I lay down my old flame, carry your new. So as we prepare this time for communion, we are going to remember the sacrifice that Jesus demonstrated in his amazing love for you and I. If you haven't already, this is a great time to go and grab some, something that will represent the bread and something that will represent the cup as we partake in communion this morning. the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. Jesus, we thank you. We haven't earned your salvation, but it is so great. It is so great that we can have one who would love us so much to know all of our sins and yet still go to the cross and die for each and every sin we've committed, past, present, and future. Jesus, we receive this gift of salvation that you've given us. We remember this gift of salvation that you've given us. And this morning we do commit that as we look at our own discipleship, that we will deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and come follow you. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Can't wait to see you next week. Well, that concludes our service today. Thank you so much for joining us. I just think it's so special to take communion together, don't you? It's just awesome to reflect that when Jesus was at the Last Supper, that he taught his disciples, but he thought about us. He was thinking about us today, that we would remember him, remember what he did for us. It just really fills your heart, doesn't it? We'll be in the book of Mark next week at the same time, 9 a.m. online. Please join us, and if you can't make that time all week, uh, we're, we're on YouTube. Uh, so you can access the service at any time all week long. So thank you all. Please don't forget us. Go to Middleburg Baptist Church website. Go to the giving button right up there and give us what you can uh, so that we can help the community, so we can be a church, a viable source of this community to bring people to the kingdom of God. We thank you all so much. God bless you all. Be safe and go be the church. Show them the love of Christ in your community. Have a great day. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.